hearts can hold many terrors, but it may be our capacity to feel that we are most afraid of. Karin Kasama. Welcome to episode one of an invitation to the invitation. A limited chronological deep dive on the 2015 suspense drama written by Phil Hay and Matt Manfredi and directed by the aforementioned Karin Kasama, director of Girl Fight, Jennifer's Body, and most recently Destroyer, among others. I'm your host, Jim Panola. A very quick background on me, I'm an illustrator and storyboard artist by trade, but more importantly, I'm simply a deep admirer, fan, and serial watcher of this film. So why? Why the invitation? There are a million film podcasts. Why make one? for this particular movie, besides the fact that there isn't one yet. Well, because many of the existing shows are about well-known films, and I want to introduce an equally deserving one that is not so well-known into the greater conversation. Ultimately, I just greatly believe it deserves a bigger audience and wider recognition. The purpose behind this limited series is to get to the core of what makes this film so powerful and effective. Hopefully converting people into new fans and providing new deep insights for existing ones along the way. I'd be lying if I said this wasn't a selfish venture. The Invitation is one of my favorite movies, period. But I'm hoping to balance that inevitable fanboyism by genuinely making a detailed case for how brilliantly executed it is across the board. The invitation may not be underrated, thankfully, but it is absolutely underseen, especially compared to many widely accepted masterpieces. So hopefully we can work towards nudging it into that realm. But enough gushing, there will be plenty of that later. The structure of this series will likely play out as follows. Reading a scene from the script, maybe playing a snippet of the audio from the final film for comparison's sake, noting what's the same, what's different, what may have motivated certain deletions or changes, and then discussing uh, on a scene-by-scene, chronological basis, ideally revealing the nuances, mechanics, performances, and more that contribute to the story's overall excellence. One last thing before we properly start, the invitation is of course available to rent and buy in all the usual places, uh, Amazon, iTunes, Google, etc., and is currently streaming on Netflix at the time of this recording, if you'd like to watch or rewatch, so you can follow along. Let's begin. darkness. The sounds of a summer barbecue, a backyard pool party. Children squeal and splash. Adults chat around the grill. As these sounds continue, we fade in on exterior backyard day. A static shot of an empty backyard tranquil, sunny expanse of grass overlooking the Hollywood Hills. A soft breeze rustles through the trees. A sliver of patio in the foreground hints at a pool. There are no people present. Just the sound of a party from some time ago strained through someone's memory. Snippets of conversation, of laughter and gossip. Meat sizzles as it's thrown around the grill. All of the sound abruptly ends in a ringing silence, but the shot continues in silence. The peaceful, empty yard, evening sun, throwing long shadows. Above Los Angeles, dusk. The sun is already set. Color fades from the landscape as the sky grows dim. The hills become an ominous, dark outline. Sounds mixed together, low, barely audible, 
broken transmissions, strange animal cries, quiet voices, things that creep into the sky, both human and inhuman, organic and mechanical. We move down through the haze to find headlights, winding up through Coldwater Canyon into the Hollywood Hills. The lights turn onto a narrow, twisting road. In the car, a young man, Will, 30s, drives in silence. We linger on his face as he concentrates on the road. Behind his placid expression, we can see something pulling at him. There's a haunted quality to his eyes. Exterior Hollywood Hills, same. The car continues its purposeful climb, drawn into the darkening tangle of streets, the orange-blue haze of dusk giving way to blackness. In the car. A long moment on Will's face, his eyes. The only sound is that of the engine, muffled by the closed windows. It's claustrophobic. Will. The voice is jolting. We wind to see that this whole time someone has been next to him. Kira, 30s, is capable and watchful. There's quiet familiarity between them, a resigned tension. Will looks over. I asked you if you were okay. Sorry. He shakes his head a little bit, ridding himself of a thought. I'm back. He smiles, turns back to the road. Kira looks at him. We don't have to do this. We can just go home. No, that's okay. It's just going to have to be okay. If it feels like too much being in that house again, I'll be fine. They drive in silence. Kira looks down at the invitation she's holding. Close on it. A stately party invitation. A bit formal, but stylish. Celebrate with David and Eden. Who's going to be there tonight? Tommy and Miguel. Everybody else you'll meet. All my old friends. I guess that's the point. Getting everybody back together. Kira turns the invitation over in her hands. This thing is so... thick. Official. Maybe they're overcompensating. Tough to just call people up after two years. Nobody's seen her? No. Jesus. I mean, I ran into her once. I saw her and David going into the supermarket together. I couldn't deal. I just sat in the car until they left. A little bit after that, I heard she just disappeared. They met in that grief group? Yeah, while we were still married. She loved it. I couldn't stand it. Somebody's bawling while you feel fine. Somebody's passing out cookies while you're coming apart. It just made me angry. You needed an anger group to deal with the grief group. I didn't want anyone's help. It's okay to need someone's help sometimes. This could open into something more. It doesn't. You could have put odds on our divorce, I guess. People don't think like that. Yes, they do. He shakes his head. The thing she did right after it happened, Kira, it was fucking terrifying. I thought she was going to die too. Will looks over at her, taps the invitation. Though this is just the kind of thing she'd... Suddenly a flash. In the headlights, an animal darts in front of them. A flash of fur and teeth. No time to react. A sickening thud as Will slams on the brakes. Splaying limbs twist through the beams of light. The imitation flies off Kira's lap and onto the floor. The car screeches to an abrupt halt. Jesus. What was it? I don't know. Animal. Stay here. Exterior road, dusk. The car sits, idling. Will gets out, moves toward the front of the car. The hazard lights blink. Will's point of view. We slowly round the corner of the car, closing in. A glimpse of an animal's leg. On Will, as he sees what it is, he recoils. On the ground in front of the car, a twisted shape. A mangled coyote. 
It's in its death throes. Its cry is a raspy gurgle. One bent leg twitches involuntarily. The sound of a car door opening. Don't come up here. Will walks to the trunk. He reaches in and pulls out a tire iron. Closing the trunk, he sees Kira standing over the coyote, staring at it. He walks toward the front of the car, puts a hand on her shoulder. What are you going to do? We can't leave it like this. We can call someone, the city. Just go back to the car, okay? She looks down, sees the tire iron. She knows what's coming. Heads back to the car. Will looks down at the bloody dying animal. Through the windshield. Kira watches as Will lifts the tire iron and brings it down on the coyote, which is obscured by the hood of the car. Even in the car, the impact is audible. She flinches at the sound. He strikes it again. Again. In front of the car. Will drops the tire iron. He looks down at what he's done. Then, stealing himself, he grabs the dead animal by its feet and drags it to the side of the road. Interior car, continuous. Kira watches as Will comes around the front of the car and gets inside. They sit there for a moment. Will is a little out of breath. Kira looks at him, then forward, shocked. She puts a hand on his arm. Will, both hands on the wheel, doesn't answer. Finally, how the fuck can she go back to that house? People deal with things in different ways. She's trying. And I'm not. You said that, not me. Maybe she wants to let people in. Maybe she wants to make some new good memories in that place. I don't think things work that way. So, this is a pretty intense and deliberate opening scene, which is, it's important to note, I think, is a pre-opening titles cold open, essentially. Uh, First off, I want to commend writers Hay and Manfredi on the script, not only for the vivid and accessible imagery, but for what seems to be a deleted scene which is everything before we enter the car and meet Will. I love this original opening, even though it only exists in written form as far as I know. And I can understand why it may have been cut, but I love the juxtaposition they craft here. This crowded oral landscape that is quickly contrasted by what we can assume is a barren present-day image populated by little more than disparate cries and inaudible voices. Yet, as much as I like it, I'm never one to criticize what I'm guessing was a cut in the service of brevity and runtime. With so many essential, if slower-paced, scenes forthcoming, like Will's many triggers and flashbacks, I think Kasama's instinct to bring us into the characters as quickly as possible is the right move, especially considering how character-driven this film is, how much it hinges on micro-expressions and questionable behaviors. To that end, we get our first taste of that with the couple of Will and Kira in the car on their way to the film's one and only real location. Their conversation is, of course, suddenly interrupted immediately creating an unpredictable atmosphere, in some ways setting the tone for the relentless tension that's to come. There's obviously some setup in terms of the literal invitation, by the way, I love titles with double or triple meanings, um, as well as our introduction to the two principal characters, or two of the principal characters, which is Will and Kira, obviously. We're given some backstory insofar as Hay and Manfredi's description of their distance, I believe he calls it, they call it a resigned tension. But all of this background, um, even expository info, um, is very important and will pay off in interesting ways 
but since we're breaking down the film in such relatively small chunks, I really want to get into the cumulative effect of each major aspect of this scene. First off, I love how in the final cut of the film, Kasama does a quiet, gradual fade-in. From Will's point of view, in essence, doing a truncated version of the script opening, the original opening, with the picture and ambient sound slowly coming into focus and bringing us immediately into the car ride. The odd rumbling sound design is so delightfully disturbing. It perfectly represents Will's distance from the present moment and everyone who inhabits it, notably Kira, whose muffled voice is the first real thing we hear in the movie. Well, hey, I asked if you were okay. Sorry. It correctly suggests that Will's perpetual grief has him firmly planted in the past, which, as we'll see, will manifest all throughout the film in flashbacks and other interactions that can border on the surreal, since Will's aloof demeanor leaves us, the audience, in a similarly liminal or in-between space that kind of distorts reality in a way. Now, I don't think Will's moral compass or decency uh, are ever in question, even if his decorum is, as we'll see in the future. But his grieving is potent enough to the point that it does have an overall effect on his personality. If he has one principal shortcoming in the context of the story, I'd argue that it's his difficulty in moving forward. Generally, he doesn't have a problem feeling, which is good, and this will likely be a recurring theme of the series. And as anyone who's suffered loss of any kind can attest, it can often feel like a betrayal to move forward or to even experience happiness or contentment again in the wake of grief or within grief. And I think there's a little bit of that in Will, maybe a lot. I think the character knows that he's capable of being more present, maybe even more vulnerable in a way, but he would never risk feeling like he's betrayed the one he's lost. He'd rather hold on to the grief than give himself permission to embrace Kira fully. In fact, I think the argument could easily be made that Will's perception of the situation is almost willfully limited. In his mind, he has to respect the memory of the loss above all at the expense of current relationships rather than put both feet into his romantic and social life while, of course, also mourning though hopefully in a reduced, more healthy and long-term way. As Karin Kasama says in her director's statement, quote, the characters in The Invitation, even the most morally corrupted ones, are still complicated, layered, and even paradoxically sympathetic people, unquote. This is a perfect summary of the film's approach to characterization. As Kasama also says, there are no movie villains here, which is extremely accurate. There is misplaced destruction amid dubious pretenses, which leads to verbal parrying and beyond. But nothing as pulpy or easy as a Darth Vader or a Thanos. Not that this is a criticism of those kinds of antagonists. It isn't. And this is where casting really, namely good casting, really helps in achieving the kind of moral complexity that was clearly in the crosshairs of the filmmakers. Logan Marshall Green as Will and Emma Yatsi Cornaldi as Kira are terrific. I became an instant fan of Marshall Green, or LMG for short, when I first saw him in Prometheus. I truly believe to this day he elevated a character that was very much written to be arrogant and unlikable and added dimensions of sensitivity, love, guilt, and more through uh, an inherent charisma that I don't think can necessarily be taught. 
On my first viewing of The Invitation, it nearly took me the entirety of the 100-minute runtime before I finally recognized him behind the long hair and beard, which is the antithesis of his shaved head Prometheus look. But it's also a credit to the chameleonic LMG, uh, the outgoing warmth of his Holloway character in Prometheus is gone, replaced by the distant and pensive Will. Emma Yahtzee, on the other hand, was completely new to me, and the sheer integrity she brings to Kira is fantastic. In a film so fueled by paranoia and suspense, her energy is a generous respite to it all. In her performance, it's easy to see how Will would find solace and new love in her. I would probably argue she's the most even-keeled of all the guests to attend David and Eden's party. An almost intentionally neutral party in order to navigate the many different personalities and acquaintances. She's polite, but ready to leave and support Will at nearly any moment. There's this quiet understanding between Will and Kira, which is uniquely on display in that opening scene since it's the only time they're really alone together in the entire movie. And I have to say, reading the script in comparison to the final film was surprising to me and that writers Hay and Manfredi almost make a point to point out the distance between them. I mention this because in my many viewings, I always found their relationship to almost have an agreed upon mutual acceptance. In other words, Kira is fully aware of Will's trauma and perhaps vice versa, though we don't get too much backstory on Kira, if any. Because of that awareness though, I always admired what I saw as an openness between them that was maybe comparatively non-existent between Will and his ex-wife Eden towards the end of their marriage. Will and Kira, of course, also have the added benefit of none of the previous shared trauma, but will continue to examine their dynamic throughout. Their relationship, where it's at during the scene, where it's at before the film's start, where it goes, ends up, and more, it's all fascinating. And I'm looking forward to tracing all the different peaks and valleys that occur. But for the scene in question, the relatively spare yet detailed dialogue is is notably cut short by our first signifier of the very carefully chosen location of Los Angeles, a coyote. Will hits the brakes too late after hitting one and goes to investigate the dying animal before killing it with a tire iron. It's a moment that film critic Britt Hayes calls a subtle yet immediate thesis statement which proffers the notion of putting one out of their misery of dignity and mercy of willing grace into existence with terror these are powerful and truthful words that are wonderfully articulated in what is one of the story's key sequences that reverberates all the way into the final act that goes on to question When is mercy deserved? When is it not? How do we decide? How do we garner the will to even provide that? Etc. Without getting ahead of ourselves or explicitly discussing any future plot points, this action from Will reveals parts of his character that his words simply don't. It reveals an unhesitant duty, a need to do the right thing even as he grieves. As stated earlier, Will's morality never comes into question, but the way his mourning might affect or dilute that morality does. The mercy killing of the coyote creates a baseline for our knowledge of Will's scruples or lack thereof. As much as it relates to the overarching theme of willing grace into existence with terror, It more tangibly sets the stage for Will's active questioning and suspicion of the imminent dinner party. Similarly, it shows Kira's preference to ignore and move forward. I don't see this as a weakness or anything but a trait of the character. Most importantly, it's simply the first example of a character choosing to look away instead of 
facing what's right in front of them, even if it's hidden just beneath the surface. It's an excellent distillation of will in that it displays his willingness to do the uncomfortable, sometimes violent, sometimes socially awkward thing, to confront. Will is more than ready to do this, often at the expense of what's considered good manners or acceptable behavior even. As Britt Hayes so wonderfully described it, the invitation may very well be the first horror of manners as opposed to a comedy of errors, which is a brilliant insight because as Hayes notes in her review, the invitation's precise surgical direction and tone is really only a few degrees away from being a comedy. It's a credit to the film's constant pulsing tension. Like a good comedy, much of the gratification is derived from anticipation and buildup, as it is from the payoff or punchline. And one thing the invitation does masterfully well is create an almost maddening sense of anticipation for the other shoe to drop that I believe is paid off in one of the best climaxes I've ever seen. I have an almost visceral memory of seeing the film for the first time and being driven crazy in the best way possible, agonizing over when we'd finally know if Will's fears were justified. But I do want to come back to something that was mentioned at the top of the episode. I called the film a suspense drama, and that's for two reasons. One, I believe that's just an accurate description. And two, those are Karan Kasama's exact words, straight from the source. Some might call it a horror film, a thriller, or a combination of the two of them. A horror thriller. And I don't disagree with any of those people. Part of the reason I bring this up is because I think it proves how genre fluid the invitation is. It operates across different categories and can't be too neatly placed in any one. Maybe this is a reason it didn't connect on a larger scale with audiences, though to be fair the film had a limited release and budget, but ultimately I think this is a strength more than anything else. To me, it's indicative of the exceptional execution of the consistently high level of quality that's maintained throughout, because I think the filmmakers elevate what could have been a perfectly taut, fun, horror-y thriller into a full-on suspense drama that that manages to be one of the most brutal and tactile explorations of grief that I've seen on screen. The fact that this exploration is dressed as a relatively pulpy but devastatingly effective thriller just makes it all the more notable to me. It's the best of both worlds. It's the aching relatability of seeing someone still suffering from tragedy encased in this propulsive an entertaining suspense film. Neither character nor story are sacrificed, rather they're intertwined, as they should be, in an experience that combines our sense of empathy with the people on screen with our own morbid curiosity regarding the plot. And I don't think anyone would disagree that the nexus of those attributes are a near surefire recipe for compelling storytelling. An Invitation to the Invitation is written, produced, and hosted by me, Jim Panola. Original score is by John Panola and Kurt Wobbenhorst. Special thanks to the filmmakers and to the Panola family for their support. Please spread the word if you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you next time.